Good afternoon and welcome to our second virtual annual membership meet, members meeting. Um, we're very glad you could join us and we hope you will find the information we'll be sharing with you and the good news we're sharing with you of interest and um, of interest. So with that, um, I'll turn our program over to Juliet Reiner, our very capable executive director for her report. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I just want to add, uh, Bonnie, could you officially start the meeting? Because oh, I, we're I taking thought I minutes had, to... but okay. I call the meeting to order. I'm very sorry. No, I perfect. I call the meeting to order. <laughs> now, All right. Julia. <laughs> All right, great. So here's our agenda for today. We'll be giving you some reports, announcing our awards, um, and then the policy committee will be giving us a report, our... our um, Sue Mullins, our lobbyist, is here to give us a report, an overview of the session this year. Uh, and then Bonnie will be presenting her report and telling us about our this year's Palmetto Awards. And then we'll have our elections for new officers and board members. So um, in my report, I'd just like to go over like the organiz organizational growth in the last year, some highlights from our mission work. And then I'd like to talk about our volunteer hours because our volunteers are essential to performing our mission. And then uh, talk a little bit about our membership and support. So I'm just thrilled that we now have three full-time staff members. Uh, Lily Anderson Messick was part-time last year and this year she came on full-time. So that's been fantastic. And, and you know, Valerie Anderson, she's our director of communications and programming and she's running the show here today for us, just like one of our lunch and learn sessions. So thank you, Valerie. So our mission this past year was challenging, as you all know, during COVID-19, but you know, we all managed to adapt. Our chapters managed to adapt. Um, we went to outdoors only for a large part of the year. Um, we had some access to properties was limited, but we just managed to, you know, work on properties where we could, where access was open. Um, we had to stop carpooling, unfortunately. Um, we required masks and social distancing. We went to virtual meetings. Um, we developed the Lunch and Learn program and Valerie just took that and ran with it. And now we have FMPS after hours. So, you know, there's been some bright spots in COVID. We've learned a lot, we adapted, and, and I think we learned that we are able to adapt and grow even through adversity. So that's been awesome. So I'm just gonna hit some highlights of our habitat restoration program and some of the work that we're doing. Um, we had a great uh, grant funded project you know, Cala National Forest at Silver Glen Springs. Uh, we planted over 14,000 plants um, in cooperation with the Forest Service. And so this particular spring, the whole area around it had been eroded due to, you know, people walking right up to the spring, but there also was a hillside with a, with a dirt path that every time it rained, all that water just flowed and all the sediment and everything flowed right into the spring. So it was, it was damaging the spring. And so that we were asked to help them with this restoration project. And so not only were there plantings around the spring, but the, the new path that was installed kind of zigzags through and there's plantings, restoration plantings all throughout so that that will stop that flow of water every time it rains so the springs won't be adversely affected. And then we have um, our Dicerandra project. We have two endangered Dicerandra species that we're working with. One of them is Dicerandra modesta. And so we're not only monitoring uh, these species to make sure that the populations are stable over time throughout different management regimes um, and just with climate change and everything, it's nice to know how they're doing. If they're not doing well, what can we do to help? Um, and in this case, also this area that you're looking at in the photo, this was an area that was bulldozed and used for a staging area for a pipeline installation. And so now after that was all finished, we're coming back in, removing the invasive species and then uh, restoring with native plants that are native to that community. So that will help um, the Dicerandra species move back into that to that spot. And we may have to also assist it in its movement, but we've already seen it move 
moving back into that restoration area. So that's really exciting. And I'd like to thank our funders, uh, Duke Energy and the Florida Forest Service for grant funding for this. So another part of that project was to do a baseline full survey of the full extent of the population of Dicerander Modesta, since this is the only protected population and possibly the only one left in existence. So it's really important that we preserve this, this population and monitor it to see how it's doing. So far, the report is good. So we're trying our best to keep it that way. Um, and I would also like to point out, not only is it endemic to Florida, it's endemic to Polk County. So this is one of the dice around species that has a very, very limited range in the state. So it's important to conserve it. And the other dicerander we're working with is dicerander cornetissima. And the main population that's protected for this species in the, is in the Cross Florida Greenway. Um, there's also some protected habitat um, protected by our partner Putnam Land Conservancy, but this is by far the largest population and it's really important to conserve this and to monitor, which we do monitor it every year. But we're also doing uh, restoration work here. And when they installed the, um, they paved the Greenway Trail, there was a lot of damage done to certain areas um, along that, that paved trail. And so we're helping to restore those areas, getting rid of bahia grass and installing native plant species. And so this is just another, some more pictures of our monitoring and a close up of Dicerander cornetissima. Another big project, and this is the project that's being um, overseen by our new employee, Lily Anderson Messick. And we're working closely with Atlanta Botanic Garden and that's um, Ashlyn Smith on the left there in that photo. And so we're working to conserve Terea by number one, reaching out to private landowners and asking for permission to survey for Terea on their property and collect cuttings of the Terea that we do find so that we can augment the national collection that the Atlanta Botanic Garden is, is keeping at their facility in, in um, Georgia. So this is super important because the vast majority of lands are in private ownership and the, the 20,000 acres of potential habitat has gone unsurveyed. So it, we really need to know the extent to which this plant is still clinging on to life because it's been really set by, back by disease issues. So what you're looking at there is not just a tree, it's actually a re-sprout of a tree that used to be much larger. And that's really the extent of what we're dealing with. There are no actual original trees left. Everything is, is a re-sprout. Um, so we're working really hard with partners to try to understand the disease, the fungus that's impacting the trees and, and get a better idea of exactly how many trees are out there. And by taking cuttings and preserving them in an offsite collection, we're helping to preserve the genetic diversity that remains in the species. So here's a picture of some pictures of how it's done. So we collect the cuttings, which we collect with a permit. See so what we have both landowner permission and we have a permit from the state of Florida to collect. And so their cuttings are bagged up. They're sent to Atlanta Botanic Gardens. They, they root the cuttings. And then on the right, you can see what a rooted cutting looks like. And then when they go from this out, when they're finished in the pots, then they're actually planted out in the, in the Terea nursery that um, Atlanta Botanic Garden is overseeing. And fortunately, they got funding this year from US Fish and Wildlife Service to double the size of their Terea nursery. So that's awesome. So out of the 20,000 acres of, of potential habitat, we surveyed this up to this year about 2,100 acres. And you can see the, the currently known Terea tree locations. They're the purple dots on that map, but you can tell there's a whole lot more area for us to survey. So this, this is a long range project. Another one of our projects is um, the wary amplexifolia conservation. It's, it's a combination of land acquisition and management of currently protected lands. And we're working with our partner Putnam Land Conservancy. They've acquired a number of properties 
the Florida Native Plant Society acquired uh, two properties and we are managing those, actively managing those as is our partner. And then we also have private landowners that we're working with because there are private landowners out there who are interested in maintaining habitat for this species and for the endangered sandhill habitat. So that's been awesome working with private landowners. We're also doing monitoring of rare species and habitat restoration work at Lake Louisa State Park. So the three species that you're looking at here from left to right, we've got Polygola lutonii, Waria and Plexifolia, and this uh, rare grass, Schizacrium nivium. So all of these plants um, were rescued from nearby um, areas that are being slated for development. And so we're trying to rescue entire populations of rare and also common species, and they're being um, reintroduced into restoration areas at Lake Louisa State Park, Oakland Nature Preserve, and St. John's River Water Management District. And so actually some of the species you're looking at are not necessarily the plants we rescued, but the children of the plants that we rescued. So that's been a huge success um, and we're really helping to bump up the biodiversity at the park. We're also doing restoration monitoring at Bill Frederick Park in Orlando. So this is a site that was a recipient site for a huge rescue about three miles down the road. Uh, the scrub habitat in the, in the southern part of the Mount Dora Ridge that runs through Orlando is almost completely developed now. After, you know, these, these last few developments go through, there's only going to be a hundred or few or less acres left of this habitat. And it's home to like so many endemic Florida species that are critically endangered and they're just amazing species. I mean, this is just three, <laughs> three of the rare and endemic species that occur here. Lupinus aridorum or scrub lupin on the left, uh, Banamia grandiflora there in the center, and Nalina bretoniana on the right. And so it's so important to, to help conserve these species and to restore the remaining habitat that is protected currently. We were just a before and after shot of one of the restoration areas at Bill Frederick Park. You can see on the left, a total blank slate. That used to be a disc golf, um, part of the disc golf course. And so it was just, you know, you don't see any species at all there. It's just bare because of all the walking back, back and forth. But now you look at it with all the plants that we've introduced, um, the, the scrub habitat is just coming back to life and the gopher tortoises are moving in. It, it's awesome. And here's a shot from St. John's River Water Management District, the Little Italy site or near Lake Apopka. Great uh, sand hill site, great recipient site. And so the, the rescue efforts and the reintroduction um, efforts that we're working on here are, again, just like with the, the, the state park, they're helping bump up the biodiversity here. So it's a huge help to um, the land managers who are actively restoring the property. And so FF, our communications have just ramped up. They continue to grow and grow and grow. And, you know, I thank Valerie for all she's done. And I thank Lily because Lily's really stepped up and helped into help too, because we get so many questions and comments through our social media. And we try to answer everybody in as timely fashion as we can. So thank you all uh, for participating. And, and if you don't know, we do have a not only a, a Facebook page, but we also have a private members only Facebook group. So check that out if you're interested. It's the nice thing about the Facebook groups is you can search like for a plant or topic, and you can also get so much feedback from our members. It's really a great resource. And of course we couldn't do anything without our volunteers. And we've had just, you know, even in this year of COVID like tremendous amount of volunteer hours. So we had 20 app chapters reporting this year, over 17,000 hours. And the value of those hours is like $412,000. And then there, we also track education hours. So that's the number of hours that people spend um, attending like our chapter presentations. And that's over 5,800 hours this year. So that's been fantastic. And then our board members, many of them have like special skills that we would otherwise have to pay for, you know, sometimes $150 an hour. So the value of their contributed services has been over $116,000 this past year. So we are really, really grateful for those people who, you know, dedicate their time and their skills to the society. And FMPS membership, woohoo!
<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a year ago, we had 4,200 members, which at the time was a high. But today, we are at an all-time high forever. We're over 5,000 members now. It's so exciting. And this just happened like in the last week. We finally bumped up over 5,000. So that is so hugely exciting. And then I have one more surprise announcement that just fell into my email today. Um, the Florida Native Plant Society applied to be a research partner with the Center for Plant Conservation. And I just got the email this morning that we have been accepted and that their board of trustees voted 100% and wholeheartedly, in the words of their president, to support our membership in the Center for Plant Conservation. And I'm so happy to share that news with everyone at this meeting right now. Thank you all so much and let's take it to the next level. So I'd like to thank all of the people who donated to our Conservation Grant Award this year. Uh, we had chapters donate, Tarflower, Sea Rocket, Dade, and then we had a lot of individuals um, donate this year in honor of Don and Joyce Gann. So that's, that's super special. And thank you all, Cami and Lindsay, Patty, Elizabeth, Sally, and then Carol Goodyear and Jen and Samuel. Thank you all so much for your donations to the Conservation Grant Award. And this year's award, we, we received 10 applications, which I think is a probably an all-time high. And they were evaluated by the committee for their adherence to the application criteria and the appropriateness of the budget. And so this year's award is $5,000. It was submitted to the by the Pinellas chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society to do a floristic inventory of the Douglas property acquisition, which is in central Pinellas County, Florida. For those of you who don't know, the Douglas property was in danger of being developed. It had been sold to a developer. There was a huge community uprising and our Pinellas chapter was like right there, like lobbying to save this property, which, you know, the former owner had wanted it to be preserved. So, you know, thankfully all the hard work, all the fundraising and they were able to acquire the property the county was. So now the chapter is going to continue to be a partner with the county and they're gonna do a floristic inventory of the property so they can help uh, with the management plan of the property. So that's pretty exciting. And our Dan Austin Award for Ethnobotany, we only received one application this year. So please tell everybody you know, especially students you know, studying anything having to do with the relationship between plants and people, anything like that. And please encourage them to apply for the award. Um, we did evaluate the application and it was an excellent application. Um, it adhered to the criteria and the budget was appropriate. And we had um, a donation from the Palm Beach County chapter of FMPS. Thank you very much. And the award is $1,500 to Jessica Balerna of the University of South Florida. And the project is evaluating the trade-offs among biophysical and cultural ecosystem services in freshwater wetlands impaired by groundwater extraction in the Tampa Bay region of Florida. This is a huge issue right now in that region and other places in the state. So this will be a really exciting uh, project to see the results of. Unfortunately, our Science Advisory Committee Chair, Paul Schmalzer, cannot be with us. He's had a family emergency, so I'll go ahead and announce the science awards for this year. First of all, thank you to our two chapter donors, the Sea Rocket chapter and Tar Flower chapter. Tar Flower donates in honor of Sam Hopkins for this award. So there's three grant awards going out this year. Um, Caitlin Bumby submitted the um, Board for uncovering the true origin, origins of rare orchid endemic to Florida, of a rare orchid endemic to Florida. That's a $1,500 award. And another $1,500 award to Shelby Krupar from the um, University of Florida. Genetic diversity and spatial genetic structure of Guzmania monostachia. I think that's how you say it. And then another $1,500 award to Maria Pimienta. And she's from Florida International University. Diurnal and nocturnal pollination of Guertarda scabra in the Pine Rocklands of South Florida. I hope I haven't mangled those names. 
And so new this year, we have uh, the Cornelia McNamara grant. And we thank you, Chris Calder. He sponsored this award for three years. And we received uh, two applications for the award this year. And they were evaluated by the committee for their scientific merit, relevance to the objectives, and the quality of their methods and appropriateness of the budget. And so the winner this year for the first time ever Cornelia McNamara grant is Gage LaPierre from the University of Florida, an award of $1,500. And he will be studying seed mixture strategies in ground cover restoration of pine savannas. So that's a pretty cool, pretty cool study there. So I'm, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our landscaping chair, Ron Blair. Take it away, Ron. Thank you, Juliet. This year, we had uh, applications and awards in four of our categories, uh, including a butterfly garden, restoration, residential, and institutional categories. We start with the Ed Yarborough Nature Center, which is located um, on a natural lands uh, program from Seminole County. Uh, this garden was designed established by volunteers in 2006. In 2009, a water feature was added, and this may not be a sequential slide. Here we can see the center. So there is, there is a, this is a, a natural area again. So um, individuals as well as, as groups and schools uh, do go to these sites. In 2011, the couplet fern chapter officially took responsibility for the garden. So they've been maintaining it since 2011. The purpose is to show successional and seasonal growth of native plants that thrive in sandy soil throughout the year. Um, this particular uh, garden is planted in a sand pine scrub area. This is of course a, a, a picture of the water feature that was added. And here we see uh, nice signage uh, from Seminole County, their natural lands uh, program, um, as well as uh, a nice sign addition for the couplet fern chapter um, of the Florida Native Plant Society. And to our right, we have one of our um, longtime members who was, has been involved in this since probably 2006. The next category is uh, in restoration and uh, a rather long name, the Shores of Lake, I'm sorry, the Shores of Long Bayou Condominiums. This is probably the fourth project that this particular condominium um, HOA has submitted. They've been very busy over the years. They have with this award now, this is their third award. Um, to my knowledge, all of the previous awards um, and um, applications have been for restoration. This particular aerial shows uh, the area of concern, this wood stork pond at the left-hand side. And what they had noted that there was no longer a tidal flow um, from part of the Tampa Bay to the right-hand side. So uh, they, uh, as part of the Tampa Bay estuary program practices that they adopted, uh, removal of invasives enhance the ecosystem values of tidal tributaries. And they did this by restoring the tidal flushing. And then it has always been very important to the HOA um, to have uh, public education and involvement in the work they do. So you can see the before and after results here. This was a rather expensive and, and to my recollection, the, the most expensive um, effort they've done to date. Uh, to remove invasive exotics. And they had about a $60,000 um, budgetary requirement. So they divided the project into three one-year phases and they were able to fund this through conservation grants, um, through a fair amount of volunteer labor and also from direct contributions from the HOA association itself. Here we can see that they are um, actually restoring the connectivity um, from the Tampa Bay um, area itself all the way back to this wood stork pond 
using um, manual labor um, and, and small uh, pieces of mechanical equipment. And there it is today. And of course, uh, the namesake wood stork on the left. The Adams residence is located in Lake County, Florida in Groveland. Now in, in 2013, and this is a photograph in 2013, um, what they had was an irrigated lawn with manicured Laura Petalum. As you can see those on the left as foundation planting and several uh, non-native palm trees in the yard. Their goal was to reduce the turf by 90% and eliminate the irrigation system and create habitat for pollinators, birds, reptiles, and small mammals. They recognized that the site was constructed on Candler sand, which is a high in terms of elevation and well-drained soil type. So they used plants that would thrive in low nutrient and fast draining soils. Of the 394 plants for the initial installation, um, there were 37 species. They lost five, I believe, species representatives from that initial planting. Uh, and later they came back in with 22 additional species all of which um, have been successful. And that additional planting was done in 2014. So you can see it's quite a transformation. It is a corner lot, so it's really high profile in the uh, residential neighborhood. And it's, it's, it's really very nice to look at. Um, you know, so it's, it's a nice example of, of landscaped um, residential category. And they have a number of, you can see uh, bird baths, if you will, and some yard art that, that is tastefully um, intermixed, uh, particularly in the, I think in the private spaces around back. Here it is, I like this particular photo. Um, some winter day, I would imagine. Um, and we can see that, uh, I believe it's the, the muley grass um, is in seed or past seed. Our last one is an award of excellence, uh, and this is in an institutional category. This is, this is a uh, sop choppy, as, as some of you may know, is, is a fairly small um, community in the panhandle of Florida. Uh, let me see, specifically the county is Wakulla County. So I believe you can see in the background, if not, there is a, a, an old train depot across the street from this depot garden. The depot garden itself uh, is 1.7 acres. It had in it some native trees, magnolias, some loblolly pines, um, and some cabbage palms. The Saracenia chapter uh, started working with the city manager, I uh, think mayor, in 2018 uh, with a goal of establishing uh, native plant gardens and, and diversity uh, here. And they've been rather successful, as we can see. Um, they were mindful of the fact that the site was probably originally longleaf pine and wiregrass ecosystem. They are also very mindful of where they occur in Florida, where there are a number of endemics, um, narrow-ranged endemics, and they have uh, introduced successfully some of those into the garden. They presently have 90 species including three milkweed species. And I believe you can see um, tuberosa in this particular photograph. Uh, quite a, a nice display of tuberosa, in fact. And there, it, there are, you can see there's also turf remaining here, but uh, there, with 90 species, there, there is quite a lot going on here. Um, Signs identifying the plant species have been added, but there is going to be a guide that will be available on the city's website and the chapter's website uh, to the species that are located in the garden. Here we can see um, some of the rare plants uh, that would be found in, in that area in a small tub area, a tub to keep them wet, I'm sure. 
Thank you. <laughs> and thank you uh, for the winners. Thank you very much. And with that, take it away, Sue Mullins, our lobbyist for the Florida Native Plant Society. Thank you, Juliet, and thank you, Donald. That was uh, really, really nice to see things all over the state where we've made a difference. And so I'm coming to you about nine miles from the Sop Choppy Depot here in Wakulla County. So um, it's nice to see stuff kind of in my own backyard as well. Um, so, you know, this was actually a pretty good year. I got to tell you, there we don't get many of those, and particularly in a non-election year. So um, I think we should all be very pleased of, of what uh, was generated from this past legislative session. Um, this session was the traditional timing of March and April ending right at the, the end of April. Um, and next year, session will actually start in the beginning of January and run January, February, and end in the beginning of March. So everything starts a little sooner. But uh, you know, the thing that I think we must really uh, be the proudest about is our land conservation funding. You know, traditionally we would get 300 million per year through Preservation 2000 and then Florida Forever. And, and this was for our land conservation uh, purchases. And so it would be divvied up between all the different managing agencies, environmental protection, fish and wildlife, the water management districts, different folks uh, to, to purchase uh, the list of the critically endangered lands that many of us on this call uh, have uh, contributed to in some way in terms of um, the science behind it or you know helping uh, point out unique features of these lands, particularly the native habitat. So for years, like I say, up until 2008, we uh, would receive 300 million a year well spent um, those lands are, are now priceless, the things that we bought every year with, with the land conservation funding. Uh, after 2008, uh, we were zeroed out for a number of years. Uh, a few years we got, um, you know, 15 million here, 25 million there. And, you know, when you're trying to buy land in the state of Florida, it may sound like a lot, but it's really not. Um, you could certainly, in, uh, in my neck of the woods, you could buy quite a lot for 15 or, or, or 30 or even 50 million. Uh, but if you look down in South Florida or in some places in Central Florida, when you're competing against uh, development rights, um, that uh, 50, let's just call it $50 million, wouldn't last very long. So this year, uh, we actually received $100 million straight out for the Florida Forever Land Conservation Program purchases. We then received an additional $300 million uh, to help uh, add to um, not only Florida Forever, but a series of uh, ecological greenway networks that have been um, worked on for years, mainly out of University of Florida. Uh, but this, uh, this is in connection with the Florida Wildlife Corridor Program, which is a bill that actually passed this year. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, but the idea would be to add to existing Florida Forever properties, uh, acquire new ones, and, and try to create a, a, a functional linkage ecologically between the, the managed areas, the preserved areas. And it's something that we've long wanted to do. In fact, our whole vision with Florida Forever has been a, a, a connected kind of mosaic network of, of conserved lands, uh, public and private conserved lands. And this $300 million this year will certainly help us get there. So I think just with that $400 million, uh, it's a lot to celebrate. Um, no, the 100 million for Florida Forever isn't our traditional 300 million, uh, but you know, it uh, it certainly did make us feel better to have the new 300 million in funding for the wildlife corridors or ecological network. So uh, the other, um, well, let me just tell you a little bit about the the bill that was passed for this is the um, is called the Ecological Greenways Network and. Um, and basically it, it establishes this corridor. You guys, you guys may have seen, um, there's a, a trio of, of young folks who have been um, plotting this, this corridor, um, whether it's in a kayak or hiking or horseback or uh, any other way they can get there. And they've gone from south to north, north to south, east to west, you know, zigzag back and forth uh, for the last, I wanna say maybe five or six years 
maybe even longer than that, basically trying to raise awareness for this wildlife corridor. And, and those efforts have finally paid off. And, and basically what we're trying to do with this is, uh, again, the e ecological connectivity and, and, and basically try uh, through the bill to cement that in statute, which is extremely important because now that it's in statute, it's gonna be really hard to get rid of. And well, I say that knocking on wood, um, but uh, we hope then that th this new kind of program, a new look at uh, protected lands is, is a step in the right direction for Florida. And frankly, there's some really good language in uh, this bill on the wildlife corridors that, uh, that basically you kind of, um, you're looking at protecting lands and waters that um, not only vital for the wildlife, but um, critical to the groundwater recharge and watersheds, uh, but also um, the connectivity of lands needed for flooding and sea level rise, the you know, kind of resiliency concept. So uh, a lot of good news there. Um, outside of that, we had more good news in uh, the fact that we were able to help uh, do away with the MCORs, uh, Roads to Ruin, uh, the toll roads that was dreamed up and passed a couple of years ago. Um, those roads have never been started. There's um, one connector that was already in the pipeline, so to speak, um, down around uh, Hernando County that's being added to, to go north. And in this bill, what we've done is completely abolish the MCORS program and funding. MCORS was the multi-corridor uh, roads, or something along those lines. Uh, Gene Kelly could tell you because he um, sat through countless hours of, of public testimony and his own testimony and all of the proceedings of the task forces that, that were legislated along with his MCOR's uh, new roads. And, and Gene, um, you know, I wanna thank him. I can't tell if he's on this, I'm sure he is, but um, he was just uh, uh, so uh, steadfast in his support, very reasonable, pragmatic, fact-based support for not building these roads because simply the habitat. Um, so much would have been lost. It's, it's just hard to even calculate. Uh, but that is now a thing of the past. There is action to move forward with um, that road north that I mentioned. It's kind of a connector to the um, name just left me, but it's the, the connection that goes from basically uh, South Tampa up to right now, just outside of Brooksville, between Brooksville and Homosassa. Now it would continue up and we're not sure how far it's gonna go, but they're basically trying to take some of the pressure off of I-75, Suncoast Corridor, that's what it's called, the Suncoast uh, Connector Toll Road. Um, but anyways, as you guys may know, when you get on I-75, it's kind of a giant parking lot uh, between about Ocala and, and um, High Springs, or therefore between, you know, mainly between Ocala and Gainesville. So there is very good reason to try to uh, limit or, or funnel some of the traffic off of that road. There's um, tra uh, traffic accidents daily, and it's just uh, a terrible place to, to, to spend your day if you've ever been there on I-75 trying to get north or south. Um, there's also another road that, that may be looked into uh, down in South Florida, again, trying to um, alleviate some of the pressure from about Manatee County down south uh, into Naples, Fort Myers area. Those roads are not, uh, in terms of how long they're gonna be in the funding, they're not a given. Um, so they're basically, we're gonna study that, we're gonna finish what's already been uh, set out to do, but we've gone back with this uh, veto, or not veto, but this you know, killing of the MCORS road, uh, roads bill. We've turned it back to DOT, the local transit authorities, which are made up of your local governments and planners. And, and we're gonna let them determine in five-year increments what Florida needs, what we can afford, uh, how we get there, which is, you know, the common sense way to do it and, and should have uh, never uh, been upended by this MCORS bill. So that was the other really good bit of, of good news. Now, uh, one thing that uh, I think you'll find interesting is this year there's at least 15 bills that talked about sea level rise, resiliency, uh, various aspects of climate change. Interestingly, one passed, and although it does uh, create, um, let's see, the numbers here say that we've got somewhere around um, $100 million uh, each year 
uh, that would go out in funds to local governments uh, and district governments to, uh, to help develop uh, resiliency. And it's not completely spelled out what that means. We're hoping that it doesn't just mean seawalls and coastal hardening. Um, but uh, interestingly, the, um, the bill throughout the entire thing talked about coastal flooding, sea level rise, um, you know, all of the different aspects of it and never mentioned the phrase climate change. So uh, kind of shades of the past administration still hovering in the Capitol uh, in that, you know, kind of reluctance to talk about, you know, the cause between sea level rise and, and the flooding, et cetera. Um, th so the annual allocation of the 100 million would uh, address the coastal flooding again by the local governments. Um, but we were able to actually get some language in the bill that, that talks about natural climate solutions. And, and what that is, is things like, you know, oyster beds, um, you know, uh, continuation of barrier islands, uh, uh, trying to do away with uh, the beach renourishment in some areas that are just, you know, shifting things around and making it less stable. Um, but in particular, it's restoration of, of coastal and near coastal areas that, that we think are important, coastal wetlands, et cetera. So um, the other native plant communities that are in the coastal zone, um, that are essential. We're hoping that um, they, we can continue to protect them as the first line of defense against sea level rise and therefore take a, a natural climate solution to some of the issues that, that we're facing. I mean, in Miami, I'm not sure how many of you are from South Florida, but you know, Miami is, has been experiencing for a few years now what they call sunny day flooding. You, know, you don't have to have a drop of rain. The water rushes in despite that. So um, at least people in South Florida are paying attention and, um, you know, all the way up to the Panhandle, the area around Pensacola in Scambia County, um, almost the exact same thing. We don't have to have rain, but we do have floods. And, and that's, you know, obviously uh, from, from uh, forces beyond uh, um, the natural uh, scheme of things. So we, uh, we feel pretty good about that. And, and pretty good as well about uh, some, some other uh, funding that we got in. This year, we got uh, $311,000 for our endangered plant research. And that's what you guys use, of course, to, to uh, uh, allocate for grants, some of which you, you're just presented, I think it was recipient of some of those funds. Um, but basically it's, it's the good work that's done by the society to uh, help local governments and local community groups um, basically do on the ground work for endangered plant species. So we felt pretty good about that. There's you know, a lot of other numbers you guys are probably seeing in your local papers, but um, there's um, $150 million for beach management, which is, you know, we don't think is that great an idea most of the time, but um, the Everglades restoration uh, is gonna see another 284 million and then a separate 71 million specifically to the Northern Everglades, which is where we feel like there's a lot of good work that can still be done just by preserving um, the mainly ranch lands that are still there that are fantastic habitat. Um, and then uh, finally, there's another 50 million uh, for springs restoration. So in the bad news category, and y'all knew it was coming, um, there was a, a great bill um, that was uh, filed on both sides that would, uh, would have enacted the recommendations of what was called the Blue Green Algae Task Force. You guys remember a few years ago, um, the entire state was either in red tide or in blue green algae, a very colorful state, but not in the way we wanted. Um, it was, you know, obviously from the, the kind of nitrates and other inputs uh, that, that was, for the most part, um, that was uh, serving to uh, pollute, basically pollute the water and make it um, unswimmable, unfishable. Um, in some cases, you couldn't even touch it or breathe it in. So um, the legislature and, and Governor DeSantis had quickly acted uh, to establish this task force called the Blue Green Algae Task Force. They did a bang up job. They really did. We had good scientists at the table, had a lot of good input, great data. And, and, and came up with a series of recommendations that really got to the heart of the matter about uh, whether it's nitrates from lawns and golf courses all the way to um, uh, septic tanks that are polluting in, in many areas, um, sewer systems themselves that are having uh, outfalls uh, that, that pollute the water um, and how to deal with those. 
Um, last year, you may remember that uh, we were able to pass the Clean Waterways Act, which we all considered just a first step to doing anything with the Blue Green Algae Task Force. Um, it started strong and kind of got weakened through the process as most good things do. Um, but, but generally uh, this bill this year, the Blue Green Algae Task Force uh, bill, you know, for, to enact those recommendations, made it through a few committees in the Senate, was not heard in the House and was kind of um, deemed for failure. Uh, I would say that uh, generally what I've recommended and I think uh, Gene and our policy committee who I want to recognize, by the way, uh, do a really, really good job of, of helping advise and guide our policy and, and legislative efforts. Um, I'm not gonna name them all, but they know who they are and uh, we're a tight group and we get good work done. Um, but I would say that uh, with uh, the guidance of the policy committee and Gene, I think what we're going to recommend is to move forward next year and just really take bite-sized pieces of the task force recommendations this bill this year had all of them. I think there's 12 and, and it was just too much. You know, the house couldn't even entertain the thought of it. So we're gonna try incrementally, which is usually the way things change and, and see if we can have another bite at the apple and get some of these recommendations, which are so crucial to the, the clean water that we all need and, and for a healthy Florida and healthy habitat. So looking forward to uh, righting that wrong next year. And I don't want to take up too much of the committee's time, but I would say a couple other things. A priority for this next year is um, we've been working uh, with a group who is trying to restore the Oklawaha River. Uh, for you South Floridians, uh, the Oklawaha once ran between the St. John's and the Gulf and, and had many tributaries and uh, just a, a, was a beautiful um, a lovely, you know, kind of a maritime river. It was well used paddle boats up and down it the whole bit. Um, and then when it, um, when the cross Florida barge canal, another great idea for Florida, um, not, uh, when it uh, was built in the late sixties, early seventies, um, they dammed the Oklawaha and, and then um, lost about 15,000 acres or more floodplain, floodplain forest. And, 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 and basically just, you know, when you try to cut a, a canal across a peninsula, you can imagine everything that goes wrong. Well, the Oklawaha really took it in the teeth and has ever since. And what, uh, what we'd like to try to do is um, pass a bill that completely restores the Oklawaha, re removes the uh, Kirkpatrick Dam and uh, floods the Rodman Reservoir to, to keep it from being a, a lake and let it again be a floodplain and let all of those little tributaries and the other flows of the Oklahoma be restored to their full function. Um, this is something, again, we're working on with some partners and uh, should have more information for you as we move forward, but we are, again, hoping to file a bill next year uh, to make that happen. And then finally, wanted to just update you. We have, um, as you know, this past year passed, uh, into law a new Florida native license plate. And we're a little slow out of the blocks on it, but I'll tell you that um, it is, it's very popular in terms of uh, what people like and people are just now really getting to see it. And we have a, a little committee of staff and a couple of board folks who are helping with that. And I would just encourage all of you, if you haven't see it, seen it yet, I think you may have seen it last week at the, uh, at the convention, but um, a conference, but um, it's, a, it's a really neat plate. It's all native plants and um, done by a Florida artist. And, uh, you know, it's, it's um, I think something that uh, appeals to a lot of different people and certainly uh, helps us every time a plate is sold, uh, the FNPS receives $25. So it's a, it's a great fundraiser and hopefully would be a lot of help for, to us uh, moving forward. And so anything that you guys can do, if you wanna buy a plate for a friend or a family member um, uh, is a gift, it's a, it's a good idea for yourself, obviously. Um, but with that, I, I just don't wanna take up too, min too much of the committee's time and uh, or the membership meeting time and, and turn it back over to, to you, Juliet, unless you guys have questions. Thank you, Sue. Valerie, do we have questions from the attendees? I can't, can't hear you, Valerie. 
No, there are no questions from attendees. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank and you. if you want to purchase a plate for yourself or as a gift, you can go to our website. You can click on donate right there on the on the page, or you can click on the drop down how to support FMPS and uh, read all about it, see the plate and buy it for yourself and or as a gift. Thank you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kara for the Council of Chapters. Ooh. Well, um, this is going to be my last annual meeting as council chair. Um, we are going to have a new council chair uh, or that's been elected. That is Patricia Burgos. Um, and with that said, uh, let's go ahead. I just wanted to provide uh, an update on some of the activities that we're doing or just like a selection of what we've accomplished in the past year. So. Um, the council uh, over the last few years that I've been vice chair and um, council chair has um, worked to kind of reestablish itself as um, to be a little bit more efficient and functional. Um, and again, these are just some of the things that we've accomplished in the last year. Um, first off, we uh, have been collaborating with the education committee to cr uh, help create region specific inserts for an upcoming statewide brochure. And just a little bit about this brochure, um, it's a multi-fold brochure that basically is an introduction to, you know, what's so great about native plants and native ecosystems and what, you know, the average person can do to, um, you know, support native plants in their own backyard. Um, these region-specific inserts will have, um, you know, a selection of um, up to seven different habitats that are found in that region's particular area. And on the back, there will be um, some gardening recommendations. Um, and uh, each region has been working to put that together. So we should have that out by um, summer or midsummer. Um, another thing that we've accomplished is um, we've revised the standard operating procedures that the council has had. Um, and updated those and had them included in the uh, FNPS handbook. Um, this was a major, a major thing that needed to be done. Um, and I'd like to give kudos to Melanie Simon for her work on spearheading that project. Um, another thing that we worked on was updating the council website with better resources for chapter reps and chapters. Again, I'd like to um, give kudos to Melanie for spearheading that as well. Um, we have also coordinated at least one um, outreach workshop for uh, chapters and um, their members. Um, we're hoping to continue to coordinate similar workshops um, going forward. Um, you know, again, perhaps more uh, workshops to uh, communicate outreach strategies or, um, you know, similar things. Um, one of our uh, chapter reps actually translated the membership brochure that we currently have into Spanish. Um, that would, and um, yeah, so that, that was actually done by Patricia Burgos, our incoming council chair. Um, another thing that we uh, accomplished is uh, we contributed some ideas to the incoming strategic plan. Uh, we're really excited about uh, where that will take us in the future. Um, and as part of the uh, work that we've been doing with the region brochures, um, we've been trying to work on a framework for um, the council supporting collaborative regional meetings between chapters. We want to do more to foster uh, networking and um, cooperation between chapters, either for you know uh, field trips or programs or just you know workshops, etc. We want to make sure that the chapters are doing everything they can to you know carry out their mission individually, but also working together at that. You know, we're strong, since we're, we should be working together because we're a society. So the more that we can do to support that, especially as the council, the better. Um, and that said, um, we've worked on developing a framework for student scholarships for the annual conference. So this is meant to um, give chapters uh, a way to, um, basically help support students um, or at least uh, support additional students uh, going to the conference so that we can increase um, our young, uh, increase attendance of younger members. 
And we've also expanded the interchapter disaster relief initiative, which um, is meant to support participating chapters during times of national state or, or local disasters. So for example, if a chapter um, you know, in South Florida has to deal with you know, another Hurricane Irma situation and they have all of their important materials in storage and that storage gets broken, the interchapter disaster relief fund would provide them with uh, resources to replace those materials that have been lost so that they can get back to carrying out the mission um, as best as they can. Um, and again, this is just a selection of some of the stuff that we've done. There's more projects planned for the future and that's it. Thank you, Kara, and thank you to all the chapter representatives on the council. And with that, we'll turn it over to our president, Bonnie Basham. Bonnie, you need to unmute. There you go. I just realized that. Thank you. I'm so <laughs> <Okay>. sorry. <laughs> I was captivated by all this conversation and I forgot I was next. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And um, th these are some of the things that came to mind when I started thinking about our past year. But I want to take a moment and thank, as, as Juliet did, our volunteers. If, if we did not have you guys working in the trenches, giving up your Saturday afternoons, giving up your Thursday afternoons, whatever, to help us fulfill our mission, um, we'd be dead in the water. So to each and every one of you who has volunteered, thank you so much. And for those of you who might not have had time to volunteer, but but have time in the future, you will find it incredibly rewarding, not only to work on in, in a native habitat and know you're doing something really, really good for the state and for our native plants, but also an opportunity to meet other people with a lot of interest that you have. So I, I urge you to, um, to think about that the next time your chapter has a, um, a request for volunteer work. Um, and, and I wanna thank the Pinellas chapter for working on the Douglas property. That was an incredible venture. It certainly is something that could be replicated by other chapters. And I'm really thrilled to see that we got that across the gold line. Um, finally, thank you to Jean and the policy committee and the volunteers who helped go to all those meetings about the MCOR projects and sit through all that stuff in order to have three minutes of time with the committee and, and, and make your comments. The committees heard you and that is so important. And so as we go forward and as we put that ridiculous idea behind us, please remember that your voice is an individual voice, but it is very, very important in terms of speaking with your elected representatives, and in this case, these, these um, task forces. And finally, thank Jean and Sue. Thank Sue for bringing the home the money and the bacon this year. Um, she is well regarded as we are because of her in Tallahassee, and it's got, we've got a really good team working. Um, the, as I sat down and thought about this past year, which certainly has been um, daunting in many ways, and Juliet was so right, we met that challenge. And I think we did an excellent job of, of turning adversity into positive uh, responses and into new ways to um, get in touch with each other and stay in touch. I think the lunch and learns were absolutely a stroke of brilliance. I really appreciate all the effort that Valerie has gone to to put those together. And I'm looking forward to our continuing them. Um, and, and as we went into this time last year, we were, we were struck, the whole nation was struck with the whole concern um, about diversity and about um, accepting people regardless of who they were, where they came from, what color their skin was, what language they spoke. Um, we, have, we have certainly been working towards um, 
an outreach program. Um, it had started before last May, but it certainly grew when last May occurred. And as you see, the um, uh, membership brochure has now been translated into Spanish. We hope we continue to um, transfer our, translate our other brochures as well. Uh, if you have a brochure or an idea for a brochure, if you could let me know, president at fmps.org or Juliet know, uh, we'll certainly take a look at, at expanding our uh, brochure offerings. I'm delighted with the license plate, Sue is right. Um, we have two years to sell 3,000 plates. That's not insurmountable, but it certainly will require um, a lot of effort in your chapters. You might want to take a picture of the plate to your next chapter yard sale of, I'm sorry, plant sale and, and share it there. Um, but uh, I'm excited about the plate and the FMPS gets, receives uh, a portion of the plate price to go towards our mission work. So it's very important for, for you and your friends to um, buy plates and, and help us. Um, the MOLES brochure and the Good Citizen Guide brochures are two new brochures we're bringing online. Um, the Good Citizen Guide brochure with the help of CARA and the um, Council of Chapters we will actually have inserts for people moving to Florida or maybe moving from North Florida down to South Florida. We'll have inserts in those brochures that show you what types of plants do what best in the type of area that you are located. So um, it'll be a nice addition to our um, brochure rack. Uh, we started this year in, in a strategic plan. We do one of these every five years. Um, we are meeting uh, and taking ideas from members and from um, everyone uh, with respect to strategic planning and, and the goals that we want to set and you want us to set for these next few years. Um, we have a marvelous relationship with the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, this actually came out of a situation here in North Florida where literally the bulldozers were coming down the road to strip away critical habitat and we didn't know about it. So we got everything stopped and um, we were able to do a plant rescue um, and rescue the plants that would otherwise have been destroyed. Um, but then we sat down with FDOT and with the Florida Wildflower Foundation, and we are working on a way for you chapters to know ahead of time when roads are gonna be uh, maintained or otherwise habitat could be lost. So you can get involved and, um, and, and save plants and, and, and be involved with the FDOT on the ground. Um, so you'll look for that, some information about that coming. I can't thank Jim Irwin enough uh, in the finance committee. Um, Jim Irwin has has greatly, greatly assisted us in reassessing our investments so that the money that we have in the bank is making more money for us, for our mission. And um, Jim is uh, leaving his finance committee position this year, but I certainly want to give a shout out to him and all of his efforts. And finally, I was able to, I was asked to represent FNPS at the dedication of the first old growth forest in the state with, up here in Wakulla County. Um, this is a network of um, an association that identifies old growth forest in various states. And I was really pleased to be able to represent FNPS there and, and at other places um, throughout the state. And let me just finish by saying, uh, COVID has prevented me from 
traveling this past year, I've had a couple of opportunities to speak virtually to chapters, but I'd be more than happy to come to your chapter, um, visit with you once we start back into those meetings. Um, and I look forward to meeting more of you and seeing more of you as, um, as this next year proceeds. So thank you very much um, and onward. Now um, we're gonna go into the awards. The um, mentor award is recognizes individuals in FNPS who've made a contribution to the science and practic practice of native art conservation. Um, the Green Palmetto Award is for service and it, these are nominations for, from fellow FMPS members. Um, and you might wanna think about this. Um, if, if there's someone special in your chapter, uh, we certainly welcome these nominations uh, sometime in the fall, as I recall, but we'll put a notice out. Um, the silver palmettos are, um, I'm, I'm allowed to say thank you to super special uh, FMPS uh, members and uh, board members and others who have, have given um, great service. And our outstanding chapter of the year is nominated by any member of the chapter. So, so if you feel as though your chapter has, is special and they all are, please let us know and please nominate your chapter and, and, and let us take a look at it. So with that, I will move forward. Um, Eric Menjes is a PhD. I thought I saw um, information about him. I, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> These awards, I apologize. Eric is, has won our mentor award. Um, and I apologize for not having his background, but I will get it and we will send it out to you. Val, I'll have Valerie send it out to you. Um, next, the Green Palmetto um, Couplet Fern has four. Uh, Jan Mangos, Kristen Brown, Stacy Klima, and Thomas Walzak. Kara Driscoll absolutely deserves this Green Palmetto Award for her work with the Council of Chapters and Damon Moore for the, from the Serona chapter. So um, give them all a clap and um, thank you each and for, for your service and for your work. And the Silva Palmettos, um, I could probably spend 30 or 45 minutes on every person on this on this list, and I certainly won't. But Susan Carr, Payne's Prairie chapter, our immediate past president, who has picked up the ball every time we've needed someone to help us work through um, a a difficult issue, and she's she's always been there. She's always there. Uh, the same is true of Andy Nacarado. Um, Andy came onto the board and uh, she came on running and, and uh, she put together our strategic planning sessions and has really been a tremendous asset to our board. Melanie Simon, likewise, and Passion Flower came into the Council of Chapters and um, brought to fruition a um, project helping the Council of Chapters understand better how the chapters and how the council works. It was, um, it was a long process and, and Melanie brought it home for us and we really appreciate that. Um, Jim Irwin, who uh, with Tarflower Chapter, who has been our vice president for finance and, and has helped us greatly. Chris Calder, who came to us and asked us if he could, if he could help with the new um, Cornelia McNamara's, who we named it after, our new um, 
research award, I'm sorry, and Patricia Burgos, uh, Lake Beauty Ferry Chapter, who will become the president of the Council of Chapters, who stepped forward and uh, very graciously and, and very quickly translated our first uh, brochure into Spanish. So these are my thank yous to the people who have certainly assisted us in being the um, society that we are. Thank you. Um, Juliet, do you want to do this? You want me to? Sure. <laughs> so, so we I guess people are tired of hearing my voice. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, so we have three outstanding chapters of this year. Of course, it's really hard to narrow it down. You know, for years we only awarded one, but but it just just seems wrong when there's so many chapters doing so much great work, and. You know, this past year with COVID has been such a challenge. And in these three chapters, you know, if you had to pick, you know, chapters that just went out there and hit the ground running, adapting to these new strange conditions, um, the day chapter, the Lake Beauty Berry chapter, and the mangrove chapter have just been like mind blowingly outstanding. So I just thank you so much. And, and I hope the members of those chapters realize. Um, you know, what a great job you guys are doing and, and, and keep it up. Thank you. You're put, putting our mission forward in a big way. Back to and, you, Bonnie. Okay. And this is your current board of directors. Um, and we do have a membership chair, chair membership committee chair vacant if if any of you on this call today would like to discuss helping us with our membership committee um i can read these names off or we can go to the good okay thanks <laughs> um this is the slide of, of nominees for the um for this coming year um mark catelli as president elect uh, vice president of finance ann redmond treasurer susan carr and then there are four people nominated for um three positions on as at large um members of the board we are currently working on our bylaws in order to open up the, uh, the, the board, keep the same number, but open the board up to more at large um, members. So um, you've, you've seen the background of these, of these four people um, and the voting will be open for the next 10 minutes. If you will go to the um, to the poll and vote, and in the event of a tie, we will have a runoff. Valerie, do you want to open the voting now? Yes, the voting is open, um, and we people have been voting, so voting is open. If we want to give people a few minutes to to vote, then we can do that and then wait and then tally the results? Is that what you'd like to do? Okay. Yes, please. We need to give people a little bit of time. Okay, all right, so I'll set it. Yeah. You want me to set a timer for maybe yes, please. five minutes, what? 10 minutes? 10 minutes, I think. 10 minutes, okay. So I can put a splash screen up. I think I can put a timer up. Let's see. That would be awesome. Mm. And <laughs> Valerie? Yes. Valerie, how do I vote? Um, do you have the email that I sent out last night? Yeah, but I've got the program up. Do you have to tab down Zoom?
Hi guys. Uh, so we're just, we have a timer on for seven minutes and 30 seconds and uh, everybody, I'm playing some, I'll play some music in the background and uh, yeah, seven minutes and 23 seconds. So just hang out and we'll do the vote tallies just to give everybody a chance to, to vote.
Okay. Uh, one minute and 27 seconds remaining. Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. We have the results of our voting. Uh, do you approve of the minutes of the 2020 annual meeting? Yes, 100% of people who voted approved of the minutes. Mark Catelli, we received 107 responses and 106 of them were for him. So congratulations, Mark. You're the new president-elect. Anne Redmond for vice president for finance. She had 107 responses and 100% voted for her. Susan Carper Treasurer had 87 responses and 100% of people voted for her. Mac Camacho Vieira for Director at Large had 102 responses and 99 people uh, voted for her. And Susan Lerner for Director at Large had 102 responses and 102 voted for her. John Benton had 94 responses and out of those, 89 voted for him. Gabriel Campbell had 102 responses and 92 voted for him. So that means our three new directors at large are Susan Lerner, Mac, yeah, Susan Lerner, Gabriel Campbell, and Mac. Congratulations to our new board members. Juliet, would you like to continue on with our meeting? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, actually, Bonnie was supposed to like thank everyone and sign off on the meeting and close the meeting out. Unfortunately, her internet just crashed and she fell off and she tried to get back on just a minute ago and came and fell off again. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to have to close the meeting out, but technically it should be the president. But um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for voting. Um, I look forward to the, the future of the year and we're going to, I'm going to like officially in place of Bonnie, officially close the meeting out at 2.28 PM. Oh, the internet. <laughs> oh, oh, Bonnie's wait, coming Bonnie's, back. wait, maybe Bonnie's, Bonnie's here. Back. Oh, good. Okay, Bonnie, could you, I just tried to officially close the meeting for you, but could you officially close the meeting now? Um, <laughs> yes, that's the fun of living in North Florida, uh, <laughs> in the rural North Florida. Yes, I will um, close the meeting and I will thank each of you for attending. And I hope to see some of you as I travel the state this next year. Thank you so much and thank you for being members. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. The meeting yes. is adjourned at 2.29 p.m. Right. Can okay. You tell me who, can you tell me who the three people are? The three new at large? I missed that. <laughs>